Welcome everybody again to the Spirit and Truth podcast. Um, it's been a great time. I've learned a lot. I'm hoping that you have uh, as well. I'm hoping that it's been uh, in simple form. Um, we like to, I heard a pastor say one time, a long time ago, he said, we like to keep the cookies at the bottom cabinet so that all the children can reach them whenever they feel a craving. And so uh, he was talking, of course, about how we deliver the gospel with simplicity so that even a child can understand. And that, of course, is what we want to do. That's one of the purposes of our uh, Bible study here. As we go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, uh, we do it in the hopes that uh, many of you would invest time into uh, your study of the scriptures. And sometimes, not that it makes a difference, but sometimes... If uh, we're an addict or alcoholic in recovery, it helps to hear the, the gospel uh, and, and in doing Bible studies um, or hearing at least that from the perspective of somebody else. And uh, not always, you know, not that that's a, a big difference, but to some people it's an important thing. And so we hope that we could fill that gap if that's an issue for you. Um, so with that said, uh, we just finished with the Gospel of Mark, chapters 1 through 16. So we've gone through the whole book of Genesis, the whole book of Exodus, the whole Gospel of Mark. And now we want to jump into the letter from Jude. And it was a letter from Jude to each one of us, uh, disciples. Of Christ, servants of, of the Lord, uh, bond servants. We'll talk about that more as we go through this letter. And it's not a big book. It is actually one chapter, 25 verses, but just loaded with application and things that uh, are mentioned in other scriptures and things that are just barely touched on in other scriptures. Jude seems to fill the gap. We're going to talk about. Uh, Moses' funeral service, where it was just God there, but then the archangel Michael shows up, and then Satan shows up, and they fight over the body of Moses. What was that all about? So many things that Jude uh, mentions um, in these 25 verses, and um, one of the reasons that he's able to put so much into one chapter is because he assumes that his audience, those who will read the letter in the future, don't forget it was written 1,900 years ago. He assumes that you and I and other Christians before us and other Christians after us would be fully informed of the rest of Scripture or at least familiar enough so that when he mentions these things, we remember what we've read in other books of the Bible. Now, if that's not you, again, don't be alarmed, don't be worried, don't be intimidated. That's why we do this Bible study. We hope to encourage you to uh, familiarize, to invest your time. So many people in recovery, they invest countless hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, um, familiarizing themselves with recovery uh, literature. Uh, cool, no problem there. But when it comes to the most important thing, Step two, step three, steps 11 and 12, where you are supposed to have a God that you know personally and intimately. So many people neglect that. In fact, I've seen people and I've heard people talk about how they find uh, spiritual maturity or how they become spiritual by their 12-step literature. Well, that's interesting to me because the 12-step literature points them to God. Not just any God, but one that is identifiable. Uh, one that we can have a loving, intimate relationship with. One that is alive. One that has power. One that uh, desires to change us. There's only one that fits that description. And of course, that's the God of the Bible. So we never want to uh, neglect that. And uh, we want to invest adequate time in getting to know Him. 
And if you know about the Bible, it says very specifically in so many places that we cannot understand it without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And you know, for that reason, there are many people that will never find the uh, the book of Jude interesting at all. And I'm talking about people who call themselves Christians. I'm talking about people who call themselves pastors, evangelists, and bishops, and you know, deacons, and all the titles. Christian people love titles. Um, I'm talking about those people as well. You say, man, we're studying the book of Jude. I can't believe what it says, how interesting it is touching my life. And they're just like, eh, like it's yesterday's newspaper. They have no interest in it because their love, their focus, uh, their life's passion is not really the Bible. My question to them is, how can it not be? How can you know anything about the Christianity that you teach and preach and claim to be so excited about, and you don't even have a love? You're not even familiar. You've invested almost nothing into the study of God's Word. And it's not that we're better. They're going to want to tell you that, but that has nothing to do with it. It's just that it is the only way, the Bible says, to know the God of the Bible, and that is to study the Word. And if you're familiar with John chapter 1, Jesus, it says, is the embodiment of the Word. So how can you fall in love with Jesus? How can you know Him absent of the Word of God? Genesis to Revelation. I mean, I can go on and on with that stuff. Paul said that the, uh, the gospel, that he preach the full gospel to the church. That is from Genesis to Revelation. And he said, for that reason, if you should walk away from your relationship with the Lord, he's not going to be responsible. Your blood would not be on his hands because he gave you the full gospel. And that's what we want to do here as Christians. That is our calling far and above any other calling. And that is to share the gospel, not just our favorite scriptures, the full love letter that God gave to the world, that he offers to the world, we're to share that with them. And um, so that's our purpose. That's uh, what we feel we're responsible for. And uh, with that, we want to go into the book of Jude. And first, of course, I want to give you the introduction. And it's kind of a long introduction. Uh, it is necessary that we cover a lot of details. Otherwise, when we get into it, you're going to be left scratching your head. Why did Mario say that? And I didn't read it that way. But Mario said that one word means this, and I can go to that book. No, follow along, starting with the uh, introduction. And of course, we always want to begin each study with a word of prayer. And so let's go ahead and do that now. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we love you, Lord. We want to love you more. We want to know the Son. Reveal him to us. Lord, we pray that you would indwell us with your Holy Spirit, not only filling us, but filling us to the point of overflowing, that we may enjoy you and share you with others, that wherever we are present, your Holy Spirit would just ooze out of us like a sponge that is being squeezed after it's been filled with water, that those around us would be infected by your love, that they would know that there is something special that goes on with your people. It doesn't need to be announced. It doesn't need to be mentioned. It's so obvious that it is just there and that they would be attracted to it. Those who you've called, those who you've called, Lord, that they would find themselves in an intimate, loving relationship with you, understanding what they believe and why they believe it, not just getting uh, very excited about something that they don't even know. We don't desire to be those kinds of Christians, Lord. We want to be filled with your Holy Spirit as well as filled with the knowledge of your word. Otherwise, Father, we are like a dull sword going into battle, and we don't want that. So we pray now, Father, give us a heart to, to, to understand, to experience your Son, and to understand the letter that Jude wrote that is not really his letter but your own. And Lord, that you would just saturate our minds with every bit of information that the letter offers us, not just for the sake of knowing, but for application's sake. Father, we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're like me, uh, this letter that Jude wrote, which, by the way, 
is not a letter that he intended writing. We'll get to that in a minute. But you're going to find this uh, letter uh, mysterious, interesting, uh, just fascinating, really. Um, because, well, as you get into it, you'll, you'll get to know that for yourself. There's just so much here. Um, you know, when Jude sat down to write this letter, he had something in mind as most people do when they're writing something. And what he had in mind was to write a letter regarding what he said is common salvation, kind of like the letters that Paul wrote, telling us how we're saved, why we're saved, the promise of our salvation, and all of these things. And so he sat there with pen and paper, or papyrus in those days, ready to write. But then, we'll see it in his letter, he began to feel compelled. And we'll get into a study of that word in its original language. But what happened is the Holy Spirit took over him in a, in a real and profound way. And he felt compelled to write not about common salvation, but about apostates. Apostates. So an apostate in uh, a, def a Bible, a biblical definition of apostates, I guess I should say, is a renouncer, a defector, a renegade, somebody who was with you at one time, or seemingly so, but now they're not with you anymore. They've turned against, they've gone away to their own way, to their own understanding and those kinds of things. And so Jude writes in regards to those people, but not just people. And this is what makes the book interesting, at least one of the things. He doesn't write only about human apostates, he writes about angelic apostates, past, present, and future. You say, well, Mario, there are angels that are apostates even in our day? Oh, in a big way, in a big way. We're going to talk about that as we study this letter. And what about people? Well, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, Jude reminds us of here, and Paul reminds us of in First and Second Thessalonians, is that there are more apostates present today in these last days than possibly ever before in all of human history because Satan is doing his best work in the days just before Jesus returns to rapture his church. And so we're going to find out in the letter that Jude is going to take us all the way back to the beginning, to the book of Genesis. In fact, Genesis chapter 6, you might want to read that before we begin our study. He's going to talk about some really, I don't even know how else, another way to say it, but this bizarre behavior that took place between fallen angels and women and these strange creatures that came out of this unseen world. And you, you could read it in Genesis chapter 6, just to get kind of a head start, a homework assignment, if you'd like to call it that. And then, as I mentioned before, Jude is going to describe to us this battle, this fight that took place between the archangel Michael and uh, Satan, who is a cherubim, a, a fallen angel, but he's a cherubim, and they fight over the body of Moses. And again, there's not much mention uh, anywhere else in the Bible about this, but Jude is going to talk about it, and then we're going to compare notes uh, with Jude's letter and other parts of the Bible to find out exactly why. Why did Satan want Moses' body, and why was the archangel summoned from heaven to make sure that it didn't happen? What was all that about? We don't have to guess. The Bible's very clear about these things. Lots of application there also. And then, of course, Jude is going to tell us about a very specific domain, a, a kingdom, if I can use that word. Uh, where eternal darkness dwells, where fallen angels, the most powerful fallen angels, are kept chained up until the day of judgment. When we talk about the day of judgment, we're not talking about today. A lot of people today say, oh, look what's going on. So much craziness going on, and God hasn't judged, and God is not going to judge, you know. God is going to judge, but we live in the days of grace. And that's why people are so emboldened to say that they can call God whatever they want to call God. And they can choose a God of their own understanding. And I don't know why it is. It's, it's sickening if you ask me. 
But so many people in 12-step recovery want to own the story. They want to pretend. I guess it sounds like a cool story. And they say, well, the reason I have a problem with the God of the Bible is because when I was a kid, you know, the priest and the nuns, and they all want to tell that story. And you know what? That didn't happen to all of them. I'm going to tell you, most of them are liars. They're lying. You say, well, what's their motivation for lying? Well, if I have the right to call God anything that I want to call him or to worship the God of my own understanding, the motivation there, the purpose behind all of it is that I get to live life the way I want to live life. I get to screw around with whoever I want to and feel not an ounce of guilt. I get to make babies and abort them or keep them or not or whatever. Uh, I can live with a woman and promise her that I love her. I don't have to marry anybody. Uh, I could be a homosexual, a lesbian, or I could be straight, or I could be a transgender. You know, I can rip people off. Uh, I can manipulate. I can make myself God. I can make myself famous. You know, some people talk about how there are these uh, uh, famous people in anonymous programs. A lot of people live to be famous. They didn't get enough attention when they were children, so now they see an opportunity to be famous in an anonymous program or in ministry. There are a lot of so-called pastors. They have made themselves more famous than Jesus. In their own mind, they've done that. Very, very dangerous. Jude is going to talk about so much of these kinds of things in his letter. But when he talks about these, uh, these angels that are kept in chains in this uh, eternal domain of darkness... He says, they're there now. They're going to be let loose during the days of judgment. Well, when are the days of judgment? The seven years of tribulation that are described in Revelation chapter 6 all the way through Revelation chapter 19. So if you read those chapters now or you've read them in the past, you say, how can so many crazy things be happening here on earth in the future? Well, I just told you. These angels that are kept chained in that domain, they're going to be loosened during those seven years of tribulation. And the Holy Spirit will not be here on earth because the home where the Holy Spirit resides today is not in churches, not in temples, not in synagogues, but in people who belong to God. So when the rapture comes and he takes those people away, where will the Holy Spirit be? in heaven with those people. So, hey, if people tell you, you know, God's not going to judge, tell them, let me correct you, God is not going to judge in the next 10 minutes, but he's going to judge for sure. Either that or Jesus is a liar, one of the two. So, he's going to talk about those uh, apostate angels. Um, and Jude is going to give us this amazing insight into a spiritual world that is Behind, it's actually the power of these apostates, these renegades, people who have fallen away, and those who lead them. You know, I tell people all the time, I'm not surprised that people who once knew the Lord have fallen away. I am surprised at pastors and teachers who have led them that way, whether they claim that they know it or not. They can plead ignorance if they want to. But when they are preaching other things from other books and they begin to sound like motivational uh, uh, seminars. And, you know, I have a problem with, with life coaches and people who are in so many ways preaching by both their actions and their words that you can know God by these other means, by these other methods. I've actually heard uh, at least one pastor, but probably more than that, tell me, you know, I want to be famous. I seek to be famous because when I become famous, then I can introduce people to Jesus. That's another gospel. That's not the gospel that Jesus gave to us. That's another gospel. And then, you know, all of these other secular methods that so-called Christians want to use to bring people to Christianity. I don't go for that. Not at all. Because when I read the Bible, Paul didn't do it that way. Peter didn't do it that way. Mark, uh, John, Jude, Jesus, nobody did it that way. They trusted in the power of the Holy Spirit. They trusted in the power of the Word of God. 
they offered that and those who came came and those who didn't didn't and there is nothing the bible says that we can do to bring those people to the lord that are hell-bent on rejecting him no way you say well mario i was once that yes but you came around the power of god got a hold of your life he didn't send anybody to manipulate you he broke you he gave you a spiritual awakening that came through the power of the Holy Spirit. Man does not have the power to save people or change hearts. But try to tell that to some of these uh, so-called Christian leaders, and they're going to tell you about their own way, their own method. And, you know, you can tell them, I don't find that in the Bible. And their response is going to be, yeah, but, yeah, but this, yeah, but that. Look over there. I've got a new way, and on and on and on. And I'm so done with, uh, you know, people who, say that they're going to reach people in the name of the Lord that way. Well, um, Jude is also going to talk about, when he talks about these apostates, he's going to talk about a counterfeit message, kind of like what I've been talking to you about. And uh, he's going to talk about a counterfeit uh, message and, uh, and and the counterfeit message of, of the gospel and um, a counterfeit love. Did you know that there's a counterfeit love? When people who don't know Christ, people who aren't saved, when they talk about love, when you see these billboards that talk about one love and the love is love and things like that, that's a counterfeit love. No, that is not the love that flows from the throne of God. It is a satanic, worldly, counterfeit love. And um, people don't see it because it is such a good counterfeit. But Satan has always been an expert at counterfeits, doesn't he? Absolutely. We have some uh, uh, Swedish people that are visiting with us, and uh, she has her own television show in Sweden. And uh, she's here. I'm going to be introducing her to some prison gang, uh, former prison gang members and, um, and some other people because they have a big gang problem in Sweden these days. And um, she wants me to talk about uh, what the Bible has to say about these things. I'm glad to do that. And I guess from here, we're going to be going to Sweden with them and the television show. And she's going to take us to some churches and other places to share with some people. But when you look at gangs through scripture, what do you find? You find a counterfeit. It's always a counterfeit. And where the gang culture is concerned, rather than receive the love of God, um, in the way of, uh, of, of a father and a child, uh, young gang members go to older gang members who make them promises, who pretend to love them, who pretend to mentor them and partner with them, and all this, and it's all a big fraud. It's all a big fraud. They use you up and they spit you out, kick you to the curb, and you end up in prison where you take orders from them. Nobody cares about you. And uh, all of these things happen, and most of them live very short lives. And most of them have so-called friends, gang affiliates. Those are the ones who oftentimes kill their own. Um, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, sharks uh, and cannibalism. Sharks eating sharks. And it's there. It's so obvious. It's not a secret. Many of you know what I'm talking about. You've seen it. You've experienced it yourself, some of, some of you. What is that about? It's about a counterfeit love that Satan offers people. When in fact, since the beginning, God has been wanting to give us a real love. And I'll tell you, fathers who have walked away from raising your children, who have divorced your wives, who have left your girlfriends and left your kids just out wandering, and you've justified it in so many ways. Listen, get with your children. If you can, get back with your wife. Because it is no coincidence that 80% of the prison population in the United States, state and federal, 80% of the men grew up in fatherless homes. Fatherless homes. So what happens when the leaders of the gang show up and the other homeboys show up? Your little boy, your little girl is sucked right in. Because dad is not home and this is a counterfeit dad. And so we can't walk away from our responsibilities. We've got to be there. Uh, if not, you know, pretty soon 
um, the kids have tattoos and then gang affiliation and they start dressing like those people. They adopt the culture and then they're gone. And then what do we say? Oh, well, my son or daughter, they have the disease. You know, they have the disease of addiction. Bull crap. Bull crap. It's a lie. I, I'm not going to let anybody get away with that story, with that excuse. When a father is not present, we cannot write it all off and put it on the back of, hey, it was a disease. No way. No way. We've neglected our responsibility. And then there are parents, they didn't really walk away from the kids, but the parents were bad examples. You can't dress and get tattoos and talk and walk like a gang member and expect your son or daughter not to emulate that. And then these young little girls, they grow up and they're looking for a boyfriend to become a husband. And who do they want to marry? Their father. Now, if you feel bad that I'm saying this, if there's, listen, it's not condemnation. It's conviction. It's conviction because it's true. And it's not too late to change. We can enter a relationship with Jesus and we can make it right and save the lives of our children, by the way. But Jude is going to talk to us about all of these counterfeit measures of Satan, all these counterfeit things that he's worked up. So uh, get ready for, for that one. Um, now, you know, when it comes to apostates in early church history, we find out that uh, Satan attacked the church from outside the walls. What he found out was that he wasn't very successful. As he attacked the church, the church just sprouted up and grew in various parts of the world. So he stopped that. And then, of course, his second strategy was to attack the church from the inside. And so Jude is going to warn us about those apostates that are inside the church. In fact, he says they crept in unnoticed. Why did they creep in unnoticed? Because we don't have faithful pastors to teach us the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So when a counterfeit is or comes into our presence, a lot of times Christians don't recognize them because of the so-called church leaders who never gave them the full gospel because they thought that what they were serving up, all of these new methods, that that was good enough, that that was even better. Not so. And so that's gone on for a long time, and now the church is paying a big price. And uh, Jude is going to talk about that in more detail as we go through the, the book. Um, <clears throat> so in, in Jude's day and more in our day, these apostates are coming in unnoticed until Christianity, Christian people hardly even, I mean, it doesn't even dawn on them, but it should. And... Jesus gave us a parable about wheat and tares in the church. And he said that in the church in the last days, there would be wheat and tares. What's the difference? Well, wheat is wheat. You know what that is. We get bread from that. We're nourished by it. But a tare is a weed. It has no nutritional value, but it looks exactly like the wheat. And Jesus gave a parable and said both the wheat and the tares will be found in the church in the last days. That's exactly what we have. And that's what Jude is talking about from a different uh, perspective. So again, you know, that's why Christians need to be familiar with the whole Bible so that when a counterfeit shows up, they are easily identified. And uh, so Jude's letter, of course, I already mentioned it, but it's worth mentioning it again. It's going to force us to visit other parts of Scripture, to be familiar with uh, those parts of Scripture. So other books of the Bible, of course, is what I'm talking about. And uh, that's why, of course, he's able to teach us so much in just 25 uh, verses. So, uh, interesting, Jude doesn't write his letter to the apostates. He writes his letter to us about the apostates. And uh, these apostates in the church, um, I've already said it or hinted to it, but let me just be direct. They do not catch God by surprise. He warns us about it because he anticipated it. And uh, we should not be surprised either. Uh, because the more we read scripture, the more we understand. They've been around since the Old Testament and their numbers will increase and their popularity, by the way will increase more and more the closer we get to uh, the rapture of the church. And 
If you want more details on that, here's another homework assignment. You could read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, or you can go all the way to verse 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, for more information about this apostasy in the last days. And so, you know, the idea that so many Christians are falling away uh, in these last days, that doesn't surprise me because I know what the Bible has to say. I'm hurt by it. My heart is broken for them. But what surprises me uh, is the people who are behind it. And again, they are these so-called pastors, so-called reverends, preachers, deacons, uh, apostles. Nowadays, you know, people uh, in churches, Christians, they want a title. So some of them call themselves apostles which if you read the Bible, there's no such thing as an apostle today. An apostle is somebody who has seen Jesus and has heard the voice directly from Jesus, the audible voice. That doesn't happen today. If it happens, then we've got to probably pull the book of Hebrews out of the Bible because Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says that in these days, God has said all that he is going to say through his son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> So when we become familiar with the Bible, people are going to say you're critical, you're judgmental. No, not at all. It's just that I've read the Bible, I am familiar with the Bible, and I believe the Bible, I don't believe you. How do you like that? I believe my Bible, I don't believe you. <laughs> and when somebody's message is contrary to the Bible, believe the Bible. But you know, these people, they have all of these crazy ideas you know hey we're not going to mention uh the name of jesus we're not going to talk about the bible where it talks about homosexuality um and you know a lot of them if they're going to be honest they will tell you they don't really believe that jesus is the only way to the father which means jesus is a liar but pastors i have met them not a lot but i've met them and in their quiet hours, when they're honest, they will say that they cannot believe for themselves that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's got to be another way. And to them, I say, why do you call yourself pastors? Listen, why don't you get out of the church, step out of the church, or sit in the back, find a pew, and just listen, okay? But don't call yourself being part of the ministry. Just sit there and listen and pray to God that you will believe what His Word says rather than your little mind. Okay, choose faith in God's word over your little mind and pray so that God can help you do that. But don't give yourself some Christian title. Don't wear a big cross over your chest and get a bumper sticker and say or believe or, you know, have a problem when Jesus says he's the way, the truth and the life. Please don't do that because you are confusing people. And listen, you know who you are. You know who you are. You say, Mario, don't you think you're being a little too bold? If so, it's only because Jude's letter is so bold, and as I'm studying it, it's making me that bold. You say, well, Mario, are you perfect? Are you flawless? No, I've got problems, but I don't have that problem. I don't have that problem. And it's not because I'm better. It's because I've devoted, I've invested time into Scripture, and God has transformed my mind in many ways. So that's my problem. I read the Bible too much. If I have a problem, that's my problem. Um, so they, you know, they offer you all of these things, uh, life coaching, this book, that book, uh, for this 12 step, you know, uh, method on and on and on, but they never somehow, they never get around to saying, you know what, this year, these three years, whatever it is, I want to take you from Genesis to revelation. That is too boring for them. They don't love the scripture the way they love their 12-step literature, and yet they call themselves Christian leaders. They should put all that aside. First, go from Genesis to Revelation in an in-depth study themselves, and then offer it to the rest of the people. That's what they need to do. If you talk to Jesus, that's what he would have them do. If you don't believe me, read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, seven letters from Jesus to seven churches, and then tell me, that that's not what he's telling us to do. Um, so why don't they do that? Why do they shy away from Scripture and they get all into all of these other crazy things? Well, 
There's probably a lot of reasons, but I can give you some of the major reasons. Number one, they don't want to lose friends. They do not want to become unpopular. Hey, when I was growing up, I didn't have a mom. I didn't have a dad, whatever. I didn't have friends. I was a square. Uh, people bullied me. They beat me up, whatever. So uh, I want to be popular. I want to have a lot of friends. I need attention, attention, attention to me. You know, you can't get them off of Facebook for five minutes, right? All of these other things they do to draw attention to themselves, they're afraid of losing friends. In other countries, God bless them, they're afraid of being persecuted. I'm talking about where they kill people, and I understand that. That's why we have the underground church in China. But in the United States of America, in Sweden, in England, they're not killing Christians. So come on, stand up, speak up. Well, they're not killing Christians, but they'll talk bad about you. Is that persecution? Listen. When we measure it against persecution in other countries where they're killing Christians, no, I don't call that persecution. I really don't. Harassment, maybe, but who cares? Who cares? Listen, we can never get to the place where we fear men more than we fear, fear God. If we're in that place, we need to get on our knees and repent and ask God to change all of that. And he will. So, you know, if you want to teach or preach the gospel, understand right now, it is not going to make you money and it is not going to make you popular. Understand that. And I say that because in the gospel, Jesus tells us we should count the cost before moving forward. So if you want to be famous, move as far away from the Bible as possible and tell people whatever it is that they want to hear. If you want to be famous, if you don't want to, if you don't want to lose friends, do the same thing. If you want to make money, go become a life coach. Go do something like that. But don't preach the gospel. It's not going to happen for you. It's not going to happen. Not in these days, it's not. Um, so, you know, these people, what they want to do, they want to do Christianity their own way. And Christianity your own way is not Christianity. I'm sorry, but that, that's the way that it is. But <clears throat> when they do that uh, long enough, uh, the Bible never, re or I should say the definition of the Bible uh, is never there. It's only a cloud of confusion. And uh, that's where we're at. A lot of confused so-called Christians today for lack of familiarity with the Word of God. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, because of everything that we just discussed, Jesus asks a very important question. He says, when the Son of Man comes, that is Jesus, will he really find faith on earth? And the answer to that question is probably yes, but if so, uh, it won't be very much. Because 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says that the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, we're living in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That's right. They are deceiving spirits. That's why so many people fall into their traps, because they can't see the trap. And this goes not just for people who attend church. This goes for Christian leaders. The reason they're not giving the gospel, but they're giving all of this other stuff, is because they've been deceived. And what are they giving? Well, if it is what is causing apostasy, then what they're giving is the doctrine of demons. The doctrine of demons. A very good counterfeit, but the doctrine of demons nonetheless. And so it may sound like the gospel. It may feel like the gospel. You know, some of the best lies are the best lies because there's a sprinkle of truth in them. And so, you know, th this doctrine of demons, it may sound like the gospel, it may feel like the gospel, it may feel like truth, but really, if there's any truth, it's truth that is just mingled in with the lie. And be certain of one thing, it is engineered by the master liar who the Bible says is Satan. And the problem is that it makes people feel like they're saved, but they're not. They're not. I can't tell you who's who in that zoo because I can't see the heart. But I will tell you that they are many in number. And that's why in the gospel, Jesus said that the day will come 
when in the days of judgment, many, Jesus did not say a few, he said many, they will approach Jesus and they will say, hey, wait a minute, we knew you. We did miracles in your name. We preached the gospel. We did this. We served the homeless. I made coffee at the NA meeting. I did all of these things. And Jesus said that he will look at them in that day and say, get away from me. I never knew you. That's right. There are people that are 100% convinced that they're saved according to their own understanding, not the Bible. And they're not saved. And why do these so-called pastors and preachers spend so much time making them feel like they're saved? God help them. God help them. Because um, I think they're going to be held responsible. Because Jesus loves people and he desires that everybody will be saved. And these people are just confusing other people. Listen, I'm not trying to lower the hammer today on those people. I'm not. But we're getting into the book of Jude, and these are the things that he's discussing. Follow us through over the next few weeks. You'll see it for yourself. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Read it. It's talking about the same thing, that, that, that there are teachers that are saying things, just massaging itching ears, itching ears. You could read it for yourself. And so, you know, what's weird to me, it's not that people are going to turn away uh, from the truth of the gospel in the last days. That, that doesn't uh, surprise me. It's not weird to me because uh, I'm familiar, like I said, with the, the scriptures, at least in part. But what is weird to me is what they're turning to. Not that they're turning away from the gospel, but what they're turning to. And, you know, there's a, a guy who uh, is, is in his 70s. And uh, he goes to the supermarket. I've seen him there twice now shopping. Uh, he's got a big mustache and, and his face looks like a man. He wears glasses. And like I said, he's about 70s in his, in his 70s. Uh, seemingly healthy man physically and, and mentally. But he wears a woman's dress. He wears a purse over his shoulders. He has his toenails and his fingernails painted. And he carries himself uh, in a feminine manner. And I say to myself, that, that is your substitute for the God of the Bible? You followed Satan down that road as a substitution? That is the counterfeit that you accept in lieu of Jesus? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And I pray for that guy because I can feel his pain. He is at the last house on the block. Hey, and that, do you know that transgender people have the highest rate of suicide per capita these days? Why is that? Because it was that little move that they made was the last hope that they had. And when they find that that doesn't work, they say, that I, I have no other hope and I can't live with the pain. I did all of this to my body. I mutilated myself. I paid the doctors to mutilate me. It didn't work, and now there's no place else to go. Of course, they're not going to tell you that's the reason. They're going to tell you it's because of the pressure that we put on them. That is a lie. That is a lie. It is Satan's trap, and by design, Satan has led them down a road that when they get to the end of the road, they are convinced that there's no way out except for suicide. And we have to pray for them, and we have to love on them, and we have to present the gospel to them. Because, yes, Jesus loves them too, for sure. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, more about false teachers among us and this uh, how they secretly bring into the church destructive heresies. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Uh, Peter says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of Jesus coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So these scoffers, these are people who say that Jesus cannot be the only way, that the Bible is uh, uh, not the only truth, that God is never going to judge because God doesn't judge and all these crazy things. There was a guy, uh, a member of NA, who was uh, who went live the other day on Facebook, and he was giving this little spiel about, you know, 
when he meditates, he empties his brain and he does uh, these, um, you know, breathing techniques and all of this stuff because, you know, it's an, it, 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 for him, it's a way to, to get into spirituality. But he says he's an atheist. I mean, if this guy could listen to himself, he's a nice guy, probably smarter than I am, just judging by, his, by what he's saying there. But if he could only listen to himself, he would see that it is a total contrast, all of his conversation. And so I couldn't help it. I messaged him and I asked him about God and about the 11 and 12 step and whether or not he believed that uh, through recovery, we should get to the place where we find a real God, intimate, loving power, all of that stuff. And um, at one point I mentioned Jesus in the Bible. He laughed. And he said, Jesus in the Bible, that's synonymous with religion. And of course, he did the little song and dance about priests and nuns and the whole thing that they did to justify running away from Jesus, right? And uh, he made no sense at all. In fact, I'll say this. It would require more faith to believe in the gibberish that he spoke of than it would be to believe in the gospel. Absolutely. Absolutely. It made no sense at all. But these are scoffers and we have to pray for them too. And don't think for a moment that when you come across one of these people and they're angered that they're so far away from God, many of them are day away. You know, they say that the sun rises when uh, the evening is darkest. That's right. So I believe, I'm hoping, I'm praying that many of these people, though they may seem to be far away from the Lord, and maybe they are, that they're going to come around and they're going to get saved and they're going to say, oh my God, I cannot believe that I avoided this relationship with Jesus for so long with all of my bullcrap excuses, which is what we do. I was there at one time. So I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this from an informed uh, perspective, from experience uh, that I had. But there is a closeness and intimacy with Jesus according to his word that not only brings salvation, but Christian maturity and satisfaction. And that is what everybody is looking for, whether they admit it or not. Satisfaction, not a counterfeit, but the real deal. That's what we're looking for. Well, let's go ahead and uh, let's look at the outline for Jude. And uh, we're not going to go much further. I'm 47 minutes into this thing. But uh, let's see what we can do. Well, Jude opens up his uh, letter with a message of assurance to Christian, and he closes it with also an assurance. And the reason I mention that is because this letter is so uniform that by the time we're halfway into it, you're going to realize, like I realized, there is no way that a man wrote this letter. The author of this letter has to be God, who stands outside of our time and space. And he's the only one who knows the end from the beginning. And that's what we get here. So verses 1 and 2 is an assurance for the Christian. And by the way, there are a lot of outlines for this letter. This is just one. Uh, verse 3, the reason that he wrote his letter. Verse 4, his description of the apostates. Verses 5 through 8, apostates in the Old Testament. It's going to get very interesting when we get there. Verses 9 and 10, apostasy in the supernatural, that angelic realm that we talked about earlier. Verse 11, the apostate trinity. As Christians, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is a trinity of evil as well. We're going to talk about that when we get there. Verses 12 and 13, apostasy in the natural. This is apostasy that we could see happening with our own eyes. So it's happening in the spiritual world. We can't see it with our eyes, but it's also happening in the natural world. We can see that with our eyes. Verses 14 through 16, apostasy in the Old Testament through prophecy. Verses 17 through 19, apostates described again. Verses 20 through 23, the believer and his and her faith. Verse 24 and 25, again, the assurance for the Christian. Look at verse 1. Jude a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Well, the name 
of Jude comes from the name Judas. And 1900 years ago, many of you know this, know this, know this but the name uh, Judas was a common name. Lots of mothers named their little boys Judas, but because of one person, that person who probably comes to mind every time you hear this, that name, a guy named Judas Iscariot, he was a traitor. Because of that one guy, nobody names their child anymore. In fact, nobody even names their dog that anymore. Or I don't know if they ever did, but they don't now. Why is that? Because the name of Judas is synonymous with traitor. And that's important. That's not just, in, we don't want to mention that just in passing. It's important because just like today, one Christian, one Christian whose lifestyle or teaching is not aligned with the word of God, that one Christian gives Christianity a bad reputation, all of Christianity. And then people judge Christianity by that one person. Why is that? Well, because when we call ourselves Christians, people start paying attention to us. They're watching, they're listening, they're waiting to see if we get tripped up. And we do get tripped up. But we don't want to fall into heresy. We make mistakes. We get tempted. We fall into temptation. I do. And that's just the reality because we were born into sin. But when it comes to our doctrine, when it comes to what we teach, when it comes to the lifestyle, it matters. It matters. And so, you know, later on, what happens with these people, what they've heard and seen, that's going to determine the choice. And I'm talking about people who may get saved later on. They're going to think about that one Christian. Like, you know, all of these people who claim to, you know, all the nuns and the priests, and that's why I don't believe in the God of the Bible. And they think it makes them sound like the victim, you know, today, I don't know when it happened, but today victims are the heroes. It used to be that the heroes were the heroes, right? Nowadays, victims are heroes. It's all turned around because Satan has done that. But they're going to blame you. And they're going to blame, like they want to blame priests and nuns and all of that stuff. You know, we don't need that. There's already too much confusion in, in the church. So if you're a Christian and you get tempted, man, pull out. Don't go through with it. Pull out. And, uh, you know, if you're a Christian, uh, particularly those in ministry, and you're always going around begging, asking for money, oh, you know, if our church has done anything for you, please send your money. We want to do this, and we want to do that. We can't do it without your money, you know. Poor God is broke. He filed bankruptcy, Chapter 7, last week. You know, if that's what you're doing, please stop it. Please stop it. Or don't call yourself a pastor. Tell people, you know, you need money for whatever. But don't do it in the name of Christianity or ministry. Please don't do that. Because you're making people believe that God is broke. And smart people are looking at that. They say, hey, I'm broke. I don't need a God that's also broke. <laughs> so please don't do that. Um, you know, we live in a day when Christianity has been so misinterpreted that hardly any unsaved person even knows what real Christianity is. When they think of Christianity, they think of beggars, liars, manipulators, cheats. When they think of Christianity, they think of that one scripture that somebody said somewhere along the line, but they know nothing else about the rest of the Bible. And so we don't want to hurt what God is doing. If you want to drop out, drop out, but please don't uh, make for any more damage, I guess I would say, right? Because that's why so many people today think that they're Christians. You know, they think they, if I stop drinking and using drugs, I'm a Christian. If I'm an American, I'm a Christian. Uh, if I leave my gang, I'm a Christian. If I care for the homeless, I'm a Christian. If I join a religion, I'm a Christian. No, no, that's not what the Bible says. Um, a person is saved, not because they're better people or because they're, they don't have sin, but it's because they trust in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And their faith is evident because they pursue God through his word. And I'm sorry, but if anybody tells you different, they are lying to you. And we're going to see that in the book of Jude. Um, uh, again, so verse 1, Jude identifies himself as a bondservant. In the original language, that is doulos, that is a voluntary slave for life. And he says that his brother is James. Why does he mention that his brother is James? Well, 
it is because he feels unworthy to mention that he is also the half-brother of Jesus. That's right. Jude and James were the half-brother of Jesus. And by the way, this Jude and James who wrote the book of James, they are not Jude and James who were the apostles. These are two different guys. Remember, a lot of men in those days were named James and Jude, among other names. Peter, another uh, very common name. So if you read Mark chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, and Galatians chapter 1, verses 18 through uh, 19, then you'll see that Jude and James were the half-brothers of Jesus. Half-brother because Joseph was not the father of, uh, of, of Jesus, although he was the father of Jude and James. They shared the mother, Mary. And this is where Catholics have a difficult time because they believe that Mary was a perpetual virgin. Not so. She went on to have other children. So she was a, a good woman, a favored woman, but she did not die a, a virgin. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, that's the problem that, uh, that Catholics have. But the reason Jude says it that way, that he's the brother of James, is because he doesn't want to suggest that he's equal to Jesus in any way. And he doesn't want to suggest that he deserves special attention. So many Christians today think that they, you know, they, they, they uh, deserve some kind of special attention. No, no, we're all the same. We're all the same. And so Jude uh, was the brother of James. And James, of course, for a while was the pastor of the church in uh, Jerusalem. But never did they consider themselves to be uh, equal. Uh, they were just, you know, two members of the family of God. So, you know, not it's not Deacon Jude or Pastor Jude or Apostle Jude or Evangelist Jude or whatever. No, uh, there was no preference. They're just servants of the Lord. And, and I like that. And um, so, you know, thank God that, uh, you know, titles don't mean anything in the church. Thank God uh, for that. Well, Jude addresses his letter, he said, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and uh, preserved in Jesus Christ, or kept in Jesus Christ. And so here we see the Trinity. So the fingerprints of God are on this letter because, well, who called us? God the Father. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us, who sanctified us, Jesus the Son, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Um, he did not come to condemn the world, but so that the world through him might be saved. And of course, who preserves us or keeps us? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He preserves us. He protects us. We have the guarantee of our inheritance. He seals us, the Bible says. So we can see who the author of the letter is, and it is God the Father, the Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And then Jude writes, he says, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied. I like that. Mercy is up and down. Peace is within, and love is poured out of us, right? And notice that Jude says multiply. Why does he say multiply? Because he assumes being children of God, the living God, that we already possess mercy, peace, and love, but he wants it to be multiplied. How and when does that happen? When we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people think that, you know, when you're baptized of the Holy Spirit, that is you start preaching real loud and you sweat when you preach and you jump up and down and you go from side to side and you're just powerful. No, that's a lot of physical effort. And sometimes that's evidence of the baptism of, baptism of the Holy Spirit. I would say most often it's not. Praying in tongues, hanging from the chandelier, dancing with snakes has nothing to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some will preach and pray in tongues, but you'll probably never know it because Paul says we do that in our closet. 
market. We don't do that publicly. It's just going to mess with people confused, and we don't do it that way. So lots of those things will get straightened out as we uh, study his letter. Um, well, if Jude assumes that we have it, then why is it that we lose this experience of mercy and peace and God's love so often? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he tells us there that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Well, Satan does not have the power to devour us or destroy us. Um, he can't destroy us because we are preserved by the Holy Spirit. But he can steal something from us. And a lot of people think he could steal our salvation. No, he doesn't have the power to do that. But he can steal this experience of mercy and peace and love if we let him. How does he do that? Same way any other thief will rip you off. He does it when you're not looking. Which is why we don't want to be distracted by the temporal things of the world. Which is why I tell people all the time, if you're going to five NA meetings, AA meetings a week, and you go to church for an hour and a half a week, to what will your mind be given most to? To the stuff you hear in 12-step meetings. Uh, lots of the things that you hear in 12-step meetings are going to fly completely against the Bible. There'll be some information there that is worth putting in your pocket for sure. But listen, we want to be brainwashed by the Bible, not other things, because other things are temporal. Listen, I've heard it said so many times that so-and-so passed, and we'll see him in the big meeting in the sky. Listen, there ain't going to be no big meeting in the sky. Okay? If there was, the Lord would have told us that. What's going to be in the sky or in heaven when we get there, you can find that in, Revel in the book of Revelation. We shouldn't be making things up like that because we're confusing people. So 12-step meetings are one thing. The gospel is a whole other thing. They, they're not, they should not be both put on the same uh, shelf. And so you want to be more like Christ? Get to a Bible-teaching church. That is a church that promises to take you to Gen from Genesis to Revelation, not all this other stuff. We don't need all the other stuff. Not at this uh, day and age, right? But you'll see that, of course, again, as we go through uh, the book of, uh, or, or the letter of, of Jude. And so whenever our minds are, are focused uh, on things that are not the word of God, not on the kingdom, we're going to be consumed by such small things that we're going to want to be made into big things. And it's ridiculous uh, to do that. And eventually, not only is it ridiculous, but it's going to take us away from the experience that God wants us to have in the way of his mercy, peace, and love. And that is why you wrote his letter. And so next week, we're going to get into uh, some things. We're going to get into this uh, spirit realm. We're going to see darkness up close, these unforeseen uh, forces, and people who work with them knowingly and unknowingly. Um, and they are a constant distraction, and they may know it or not know it, but they are designed by Satan to lure us away from God's truth and the direction he has for our lives. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would be of one mind according to your word and nothing more and nothing less, doing only the things, Lord, that you called us to do. Thank you for this Jesus.